So in this one, we're going to pre-process the, pre the data and do some quality assurance stuff to it. And I'm going to be moving a tiny bit faster than I was in the earlier module. So when I say pre-processing, I mean before you get into the gating and the clustering and the all of that actual analysis stuff, you have to pre-process your data and make sure that what you're starting with is something that makes sense. Um, so things such as compensation, which we expect you guys to already understand that really well and know what the best way is to do it. Ryan already addressed that. Uh, also how to transform your data. So the transformation is important. In, in Flojo, when you're looking at your data, it, it kind of doesn't really transform your data, but it transforms it for display purposes, right? So that it looks nicer, so that it, you can gate it, you know, on the screen. Um, choice of transformation is very important, as I will show you on the next slide. Also remember that um, how we had when we were plotting the forward scatter, side scatter, dot plots of the flow frame, and there were these dots sort of at the end of the of the plots that were the margin events of flow, uh, forward scatter because the cytometer is not capable of recording values greater than a certain value and it just assigns that value to the ones that are greater. That's kind of like a technical kink that we, we should clear up in order to facilitate the automated gating later. So that's going to be what I'm going to do up until the coffee break and then a little bit after the coffee break probably and then at the end before dinner I will do quality assurance some example remember Ryan was going over some of the the quality assurance things and there was this HTML web page with these green dots and yellow mm -hmm. dots and red dots we're gonna actually make one one of those <laughs> Uh, and I'm just going to focus on some simple ones just so that you get accustomed to how to work with that package that creates those quality assurance HTML uh, web pages so that when you're later reading the vignette for that package, you will know what's going on and be able to do fancier stuff. So pre-processing steps. They vary from data set to data set. Different data sets have different sort of little issues you have to clean up. But this is the common, the common ones. First of all, you have to compensate your data well. Otherwise, further analysis will be meaningless. I have seen many data sets where they send me the data set. It's already been compensated poorly. And all the information about how it was compensated is they just don't know what they did, how, what the software was doing. And, but they're still giving me the data and hoping that I can do something with it. I can't. Like Ryan said, garbage in, garbage out. If you give me crappy data, there's nothing I can reverse engineer about it that's going to get it to its original higher quality condition. There's also issues with poor staining or poor experimental design, panel design, whatever, cytometer issues, where no matter what you do, you just can't, the compensation is terrible. It's just, there's nothing you can do to make the data look, be, be good. And again, there's nothing we can do about that. If that's your data, then that's too bad. So when you say the compensation was terrible, they don't know what they did. Was they were actually manually changing the compensation? On the, yes, on the and also, as the, as the, as the being I believe that that's what I, it's a very excellent question. They couldn't really give me a straight answer. Um, and I don't know why that was. But uh, also in Flojo, they watched around with something and in Flojo did something, but they didn't know what Flojo was doing. And uh, they just assumed that if they just hand, hand me the, the files, I should be able to magically like reproduce everything the Flojo ever did, like as if I'm a machine. So uh, there's also cases where, biologically speaking, not um, the the physical parameters of the experiment setup make it so that you know certain stains just don't go well together, right? You just no matter what you do, like try to compensate, it just still looks like crap in the end. So what, what, what I I'm saying do, I will not do that for you. I cannot. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying what I, what I tend to do is we use single, single we use beads with single color staining, mm -hmm. and then we set up a compensation. So we <coughs> collect beads with single colors. When we when we when we think we've got our voltages about right, mm -hmm. um, then you can collect um, 
single color comps, um, and then let Deidre calculate a matrix. Yep. And then apply the matrix to your data. Then you go back and collect some more cells, and if the voltages still look about right, yep. then you probably got your comps and your voltages about right. Yep. That that's sounds it. like something yeah. very good. Yeah. So that's no, it doesn't always happen. No. So make sure it happens because if it doesn't, then so just keep doing that. Exactly. Keep doing the right thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so that's one thing that I just had to point out that if 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 you have poor starting data, there's nothing I can do about it. Then the next step, you construct a procedure to objectively remove debris, doublets, margin events, all of these pre-processing things. And objectively means that because we're going to be automating all of this, you're not going to be gating each and every sample separately or anything like that. You're going to try to think of some kind of way that you can do it objectively. So like Karim was saying, manual gating there's a lot of variability. You give it to one person, then you give it to the next, they gate different things. Slightly different, but maybe if you gate 25 populations in a row, in the end, you end up with completely different populations than you started with. So, so is it, do we have half of these available to do uh, double discrimination? No. Uh, there's. But we can do it. Yeah. So um, that's questionable. Yeah, so it's like, are there, we have the tools to do it. Sure. Yeah. We do. We, we have to do it. We do it all the time. Yeah. Um, we have to have some objective function in your head. What what okay. is a double? Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. usually it's based on position, and so you find for the side, you find stuff that's above someone. Yeah. You use uh, force, yeah, force better area versus force better area. Right. Right. You you can use any number of that's biological, use a biological yeah. location that you have that you think best describes. All of the all of these procedures, removing the debris, doublets, margin events, they're all the way that you co construct this code, this procedure is you think about how do I do this manually in FlowDrill? Well, you know, I go like this. Or what is the? How do you go like this? Well, I try to get rid of all the really low forward scatter things, and you know, capture most of them, but not the really far away dot. You know, you you think logically when you're when you're gating it on with your mouse on the screen. So you try to encode that logic into R, and we will do this. The R part is the hard part. Yeah, so uh, putting it into logical <laughs> terms is yeah, definitely. Try yeah. to describe, people have this intuitive sense of what it is, but it seems to be very difficult to people to write down what the rule is, because quite often these rules are variable and they change, and then it becomes a then it becomes hard to program because the program requires a set of rules. You have to be able to explain it to a computer what how how you're gating. You can't just tell me, oh, you get it like this. No, yeah. what does this mean? <laughs> a little bit, little bit, yeah, no, 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 no. yeah, exactly. What do you mean? Do you, exactly. We'll, we'll we'll get there. Uh, so after you have removed your debris and all of these useless cells you don't want to be working with, um, you transform your data carefully. Um, and after that, of course, after the transformation, you're going to be able to remove the dead cells and then proceed with the regular analysis, you know, the, the interesting analysis where you do your gating or discover your diagnosis or whatever you're doing. So today we're just going to be pre-processing. It's probably the most, more, more important than the actual gating part. So I'm going to talk a little bit about transformations. Um, log, you know, it's a, a, a lot of the channels that you measure on a log scale, right? So when you look at them, your, your plot will have, you know, 0, 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3 on the... It's because it's on a log scale, so we have to transform the values so that they make sense to us when we look at them. A uh, log, by definition, cannot handle negative values. A log of a negative number is undefined, mathematically speaking. Um, so in Flojo, that's when all these negative cells, instead of undefined, Flojo just sets them to be zero right on the margin. So that's that's when you sometimes get a warning that you have too many cells on the margin. It's because you're using log and you know you have too many negative cells. When you have a compensation, you know how a lot of the values actually get pushed to be negative because your compensation is good. So sometimes if you have too many negative values, 
and you use log, they're going to end up on the, on the axis and you're not going to be seeing what your data actually looks like. You're just going to be looking at some dots in the plot and a bunch on the margin that really doesn't, it's not very informative. So what people do instead is use the bi-exponential. Bi-exponential is just a class, a family of functions that um, you, how, how many here have heard of arcsinch? Yeah? Heard it. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just a, it's, it's one type of bi-exponential function. Another one is logical. Has anyone heard of logical? Usually when, when you go to Flojo and you go to, actually I don't know, but I assume that this is what Flojo is doing. Because <laughs> so, Flojo doesn't tell you exactly the formula that they're using, but it's essentially using a logical transform. It's just another type of bi-exponential um, transform. And arcsinch is defined for negative values. So it's better than log in that sense, because it, if you give it a negative value, it's not going to put it on the, mar on the margin, on the axis. Um, but it kind of has this kink where it kind of splits artificially positive numbers and negative numbers into a, make it look like two separate populations sometimes. Uh, I will show you uh, a picture in a minute. The logical transform addresses that issue with arcsinch. So it's, it's better than log because it handles negative values. And it's better than arcsinch because it has more parameters that you can sort of play around with to make your transformation look even better for your specific type of data that you have. Someone said they were interested in the <laughs> transformation math stuff. Who was that? You? OK. So what is, a, mathematically speaking, what is log? It's the inverse of this function. y equals e to the x. Is everyone familiar with the number e? No, usually, I guess you'd be working 10 to the x, you know, on a ten, log 10 scale, but this is the natural log scale. So the inverse of this function is ln y. It's natural log. So when you're talking about a log transform, it's the inverting this function, basically. Here's arcsinch. It has the same e to the x part, but it's adjusted by e to the minus x, which is a small number. The, 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 the inverse of this function is log of y plus square root of y squared plus 1. If you think about this, here if you put a negative value into log y, it will be undefined. You can't take the log of a negative number. Here if you put a, neg a negative number, it it will get squared plus 1 and then square rooted, so it's a little bigger than itself, just negative. So it will never be undefined. It will always, do, it will always give you a value. So that's the benefit. It will be, be very, very small. Yeah. So it will just, be very, very small, so, so it will be artificially just, like. It just artificially pulls it up above zero. Yeah. So, no, uh, yeah, something like that, yeah. It's exactly just so that you can take the log of it, and then when you take the log of a very, very small number, it actually has a very negative value. So, yes. Um, here's the. So, remember. Arcsinch is defined as the inverse of this, the inverse of this function, which the solution for is here. This is the bi-exponential in general, and this is sort of where the logical transform, which is the one that, as you probably guessed, is the best one, because I mentioned it was better than all the others. <laughs> this is what its form is. A is some kind of constant parameter that you tweak to make, like in Flojo, like Flojo tweaks it for you, or you can actually tweak it. Um, same with V and same with W. So there's actually all of these and F and D. I missed. <laughs> so there's all of these parameters that you can tweak to, to, to make the transformation optimal. And don't worry, you're not gonna be we're not gonna be asking you to be choosing these numbers. We're gonna estimate them for you. <laughs> but uh, just just to give you an idea of where the logical transformation comes from, it's you start out with log that looks so simple. And you end up with something that is the same idea as log, but really just fancied up a little bit so that it can be tweaked and it can, we can do the best we can with the, the transformation of the data. Here's an example of the same um, sample we were working with earlier. Forward scatter, side scatter. Oh. Uh, we're not using RStudio yet. I will let you know as soon as we, we get to the code part. 
So remember how it was really squished and I had to plot it, uh, cut it off at like 5,000 and it was still kind of squished looking? This is when you do a log transform on the side scatter channel. Suddenly it looks much better, right? How many people think it looks better? <laughs> Good. Um, here is when you do arc cinch. It looks almost the same as log, right? Here's when you do the logical transform. Looks still kind of, they all kind of, these three look kind of the same. You know, no, not really any benefit over which one should you choose, you know. Why is that? Because side, side scatter, by physical, the, the physics of it always has, never, never has negative values, right? So taking the log of it, you're not going to run into the issue of taking the log of negative numbers. Arc sense, you're not going to run into the issue of artificially splitting negative and positive numbers into two separate populations. Logical didn't really have too many issues to begin with. So in, in this scenario, if you're looking at trying to pick a transformation for the side scatter channel, it, it really doesn't make any difference which one you choose. Just choose one and be consistent. Might as well choose logical, you know. Here's an example of where it does matter. This is the same sample and I'm plot plotting the uh, R780 channel, which is the one with CD3, measuring CD3. This is no transformation, so obviously all your data, you can't even see it because it's on a, it's exponential data. You, you can't really make sense of this. So what, when you open it, in, I don't know if Flojo, what does, I think by default it does log or tries to do log or I'm not sure. Um, you can, you can use the preference to allow it okay. to apply a cost of transformation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will, um, it's default and public because the log is Yeah. So when you actually open this with um, in Flojo, you will also see like this like really thick line along the x-axis because there's a bunch of cells there. And I've printed out for you. There's actually 13.89% of, of cells would be on the axis because there's 13% of the cells have... CD3 expression negative. So when you take when you take the log of these numbers, they seem to kind of disappear. Instead, if I did the arc cinch transform, this is what I would get. This part of the plot is exactly the same as this entire plot. These cells are the ones that were negative, and see how they are kind of artificially split for from this population? There's this like, really shouldn't, these cells should really be combined with these, you know, it should be CD3 positive, CD3 negative, not CD3 positive, CD3 negative, CD3 really negative. So that's what ArcSynch has this little kink that it does. And this is what the logical does. It actually, because of all these extra parameters, we can tell it, you know what, there's actually way more negatives. Don't, don't, you know, shoot them off at the end, kind of bunch, try to bunch them with these low value ones. So this is... Has a cool factor too, right? Yeah, it can. It's it's been divided by two, I think. Yeah. Instead of divided by two, you can do like one fifty and because we do a side back. Um that's not the one that's not the thing that varies actually. What what would they would probably have is some kind of parameter here, like A times E to the X minus B times I think that's the only thing that you can really vary there. Um you can. Uh, I think adjusting the cofactor takes care of that. Problem. Just the two? No. I'm not sure if it's the two. It's not the two. There, there is something else. Yeah, there is something else. And the logical is just a generalization of exactly that. Um, it's a generalization of exactly adding a cofactor and changing that. So it's just logical. So. Now we're going to be doing stuff in our studio. Okay, so especially for those of us with slower computers, this this here removes all of the current variables that are stored in our R session. So right now I can do X, you know, like that we did earlier in the day, they're still there. But when I execute this command, it's gonna delete all of them. It's like starting fresh. 
now there's no X. This kind of helps prevent you from getting messed up and just because we're starting a new module. This function, if you have a bunch of plots open, that can kind of slow, slow you down a little bit. So just running this will automatically close all the plots so they're not stored in your memory and you're, you know, ours, ours trying to maintain all the previous plots that you did. It's just going to make it faster for you. And we already loaded this this package before, but let's just make sure it's there. We have our directory, just in case you shut down your computer or something. This is where our files were stored. So what did I do here? I, I named this variable to be dir. Remember dir? It gives you basically a list of all the files in the directory you're specifying. So I, I wanted it in this folder just to remember. What did I have in there again? Write all my files. So if I want to read in the first file, I can actually remember read.fcs. You have to supply the exact file name with, with the path of it and everything. So here's a new function we're going to learn, paste. It kind of is the concatenate for strings. So I pasted together the string full fcs slash, which I know is my folder name, plus the first file in that directory. And you get this. Does this make sense? What? What is so? What, why are you doing this? Uh, it's just uh, if you have, for example, an Excel file sheet or, or an Excel sheet, and there's a list of file names in there, but only the file names. They're not going to tell you what directory they're stored in on your system, right? On your computer. So you want to read in all of the ones that it says next to them that they're HIV positive. So you're going to read in your Excel sheet into R. You're going to locate all of the roles that have HIV positive diagnosis and take those file names. And you can't say read that file name. You have to specify which folder it is, where it is. It, it, it comes in really handy okay. all the time. You will see this when you're reading vignettes. So. So it's, it's another way of it's another way. subsetting and putting a specific file and calling it something else. Yeah, something like that, yeah. This sep equals quotation marks nothing and quotation marks just means how should I separate these, these two strings that I'm concatenating. If you separate them by the number 8, It will insert this number eight here. So I didn't want them to be separated by anything. And now you can read it read the flow frame like this. Because now first file has the exact file name. Before we had to type type it out exactly in quotation marks and have the folder name and everything. This is just one way that you can help automate the the file names. And that's just the same flow frame as before. Now the first thing we're going to do is talk about compensation. This data set is not compensated. It, ha it has been, uh, a compensation matrix has been created for it, but it, the data we have is raw. It, it's uncompensated, so we have to apply the compensation. If you remember where we had this long conversation about this all of these gibberish keywords here and we decided some of them maybe are useful some of them not so much there was one here spill that contains the spillover matrix it's automatically saved so if you execute these lines I've just printed out just a small portion of, of them here on the screen. What does this mean? 
Have you ever seen a compensation matrix? In Flojo, you can export yeah. it, right? Yeah. This is what it is. So when you say this, what is compensation what matrix? Is the compensation yeah. Matrix, okay. So. Does this make sense? So everyone's familiar with what this represents. It's you know, I don't even know. 7% of this stain, you know, has spilled over into that one and you have to adjust it basically. That's what it's saying. Just why are they not equal? Yeah, here's another, here's another, um, oh, sorry, I didn't print it all out on my screen because it, it would be like on separate lines. So how can we, how do we compensate? You use the function compensate. Very convenient. They, they used um, the old PDBs because you can't compensate the 450 channel with PDBs. So it'll be the, the 450 compensation is all zero. Oh, okay. So that's bad? But it's just what it is. Those things. Yeah. So you can't compensate for This is the point where I trust the biologist knows what they're doing. The trust works a lot for both ways. We trust, I trust them a lot. So exactly. I, I just need something to know these guys have been using it. We, we've been told that the PDB is the concentrated size and then the rest is um, you can use them to compensate lower down on the right and that is it. Anyway, sorry. So let's compensate. So you can see that this function compensate came from the package flow core. So it's one of those core functions that is one of those things you typically do with flow cytometry data. So it's part of the standard flow cytometry analysis package. And you can see how it works. It takes a parameter x and a parameter spillover, where spillover is the spillover of compensation matrix, and x is an object of class flow frame or flow set. So all I did was compensate. I put my flow frame in there and my compensation matrix. And how can we tell that it's been compensated? If you run this, so you guys can run this while I'm during the presentation. Um, if you run summary f, it's, uh, it's another function you can run on a flow frame object. And it gives you sort of an overview of the distribution of your data. So the mi within that flow frame f, the minimum forward scatter value is 23,410. The maximum one is 262,100. The median, so that's like your MFI here is the, the median, right? Um, is 41,000. And it has this for all, I have only printed out some of them. I didn't want to have too much stuff going on. This is for the F, the original flow frame before we compensated. Now the one that we compensated, we called it F.comp, so we keep track of where we're at. When I do summary of that one, the forward scatter and side scatter summaries, they're identical. There was no compensation down on the scatter, sorry, the, th the three scatter channels, right? They we don't compensate those. This one seemed to have changed very, very little. I mean, this is negative 67.28, negative 67.34. So this one was already pretty clean channel. The compensation didn't really affect it too much. But look at this one. This one had some significant spillover into it. Suddenly, I went from having a, a minimum value of minus 67 to a minimum value of minus 26,000, right? So this is just to prove to you the compensation was applied. Does this make sense? <laughs> OK. Now. <laughs> 
So yes. And we've got, again, we, we defined the compensation information that generated the, the matrix M was already in the FCS file. Yes, it was already so automatically embedded. We, we, we linked and saved it. So yeah. Yeah. So, so when we when we load a FC a compensated FCS file into Floto, it already comes up as compensated. Mm -hmm. But when you load it into R, oh, it's not compensated. But we just have to run it. So, uh, so Floto is automatically running. Yeah, and automatically yeah. applying it. Yeah. We're basically trying to do what Flojo does behind the scenes <laughs> with a little more clarity, right? Yeah, I'm, 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 just, I'm delighted. To, I'm delighted that I'm actually learning how Flojo works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I worked up on R. Yeah, it's yeah. all around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the thing. I, I don't know exactly how Flojo works. No, this is, but I'm just trying it's to. Figure it's out. a mystery. I'm it's just a secret. It to my Okay, so we're clear on compensation. Um, the one thing about compensation is it's very important that if you're analyzing your own data, that's wonderful. But if you're analyzing someone else's data, there's always this huge miscommunication about is the data already compensated? Like you just said, some people think that just because they when they open it on Flojo and it looks compensated, that it must have been compensated to begin with. They don't realize Flojo is secretly compensating we, it we for are, them. We are so. Sometimes they'll give me the data and say, oh, yeah, it's already compensated. And I'll work with it and ask them, are you sure? Yes, absolutely, it's already compensated. And then I spent some months working on it and realized it wasn't compensated. It was just a miscommunication. So that that's something to be... It's always set to true. Apply comp. In my experience, that's what I thought when I first saw that keyword. There is a keyword that is something like this, and it's Yeah, it's, it's misleading. Yeah, it misled me. <laughs> so, okay, so I'll assume we're good on compensation. It's just compensate and you specify your your matrix. Um, if for some reason what people some people do is they'll they'll um, um, this matrix will be stored in there from Diva or whatever. But then they'll go and open up, we'll open it up in Flojo, delete that, and compensate it themselves in Flojo. Then you can actually, instead of giving this matrix M, you can essentially replace all of these entries with the entries you got from Flojo if you feel that that's a better compensation for your data. And then again, you would just do compensate F comma M the exact same way. Okay, so now I'm gonna do a little. So this was on compensation. The data that we're working on is the HIV data Ryan mentioned briefly. It has 466 samples and 13 colors. We don't have the computational power right now to be doing this in the workshop. So, so what I've done is I've just chosen 20 samples and I have only tried, unfortunately it's not gonna be super interesting what we end up with biologically. But for illustration purposes, it, just, it should be good enough. Uh, I have only selected a few colors. Okay, so I have uh, those three files we were working with earlier. There's actually 466 of them. I took 20 of them only, deleted a bunch of the colors because it would be too difficult otherwise. And I only took 20,000 cells of each. They had hundreds of thousands of cells before. If you want the whole data set, it's available from florepository.org. I don't think they want it. <laughs> it's not theirs. <laughs> but yeah, it is publicly available data. Um, so this is what I have. I have done this. So so now you can. I have actually saved it onto the virtual machine. So if if you look in the folder, it's right there. Okay, that's the. You you shouldn't have 
this other stuff. <coughs> Excuse me, before we, we define the flow signal, and what you've done is you've already done that in the site and so you just like Yeah, the basically I, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I did. I so downloaded, we, yeah. You, we, you, did, we did one with three files. Yeah. And you've gone back, but you've gone just for this. Yeah. Color. I've done 20 and I've deleted some of the colors. So, so now load fs.r data. So it has, I guess I can work here. It has 20 files, like I told you. The first one, there it is. It's a flow frame object, just like before. It has 20,000 cells. All of them have exactly 20,000 cells. I randomly chose 20,000 from each, each one. And I have only uh, kept these, these, these markers here. This vivid slash CD14, that's, I guess, a viability slash dump channel. Um, and then we have KI67, CD3, CD8, CD4, CD127. So we're clear on this. So we can plot it. Just, to, you know, the first thing you ever do when you load in your data, plot it, make sure it looks right. And remember these cells here that we were talking about before that are right here on the margin. How, how, would, how would you get rid of them? If you set your X limb, that would only plot it so that you don't see them. But I want to completely get rid of these cells. I don't want to be analyzing them anymore. I want to gate them out, so to speak. Get them. Can you use X limb as part of a core? X limb is uh, just within the plot function. It it just it's just for display purposes. So I want to remove them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> That's right. So so first of all, let's we all agree two hundred and fifty thousand seems like a legit threshold. Yeah. Just looking at it. I want to first identify the indices of these cells. Wh which are is it the first cell that's in those margin events or which which cells are they? So which cells are they? We're gonna use which for. The function which. This here that I have selected right now, express fs1. What does that mean? What was that? We used that earlier. You're switching uh, the first file in the flow set to expression values? Yep. So it's like the matrix of the values I'm taking. And within that, I'm taking the only the column that is forward scatter area. <clears throat> So if I just took this, these are all the 20,000 you know, cells, and these are all the forward scatter values that are present in my flow frame. Which of these are greater than or equal to 250,000? That's essentially what this line says. Expressing. That matrix E that we had before, yes. it's uh, basically the expression values. These are the all these numbers where okay. each row was yeah. the measurement of each cell. So you're just calling, you're just asking the matrix to tell you to tell you what those numbers are. Exactly. Yeah. Which which ones? Yeah. So now I have uh, what margin cells contains now. These are all the indices of the cells which are on the margin. The 15th cell had a forward scatter value greater than $250,000. Uh, <laughs> 250, the 27th cell that went through the cytometer also landed in that region. The 69th cell also landed in that region, and so on. So these are all the cell numbers that I do not want anymore. I don't want to keep them around. How many of them do we have? 
601. What can I do with that? I had 20,000 cells to begin with, so this is how you can calculate the percentage of margin events that your data had. 100 times the length of the margin events divided by the number of cells, 3%. <coughs> So there, we have calculated one type of quality thing, right, 3%. If that number happened to be 50%, you'd probably be pretty unhappy with your data, right? Um, so clearly, when you're analyzing your flow set, you're not going to be plotting them one by one, putting a blue line where all the cells are there, and then, you know, you're going to do this in an automated fashion where maybe all you're going to be looking at at the end is the 3%. And if you have 100 samples and you write a little function that will do this for you automatically, you'll see 3%, 2%, 3%, 2%, 50%, 2%. 2%. The sample that had the 50%, you probably want to take a closer look at that one or just exclude it. So that's one sort of hint of where we're going to go with quality assurance later today. So let's, uh, let's, let's plot. Plot this again. And let's try to uh, let's try to visualize these margin events. You guys can all see the red dots, right? That they're red. So how did I do that? This is one visualization technique that is really helpful when you're uh, gating a population or trying to remove the margin events or something like that. You want to just visually maybe present the result to someone else or just convince yourself that you did the right thing. Remember how A is a matrix here. I took the expression values of the flow frame but only the forward scatter and side scatter channels. This is one way you can plot flow cytometry data. Just give it as a matrix. Remember, what, what was PCH about? Character. Yeah, point character, yeah. And the Y limb was just for the display, right? Just so that it looks prettier for us. I just wanted the Y values to go between 0 to 1,000 because there really is, there's like maybe one or two dots higher than that. Now this points function, what it does is it will plot the thing inside of it on top of the current plot you already have. So this first plot is just of all the black dots, right? Everything. The second plot, because I'm not saying plot, I'm saying points, is going to keep this plot open and add some points additionally on top of the current plot. And what, are, what am I actually plotting this time in, re, in red? Subset of the matrix. Exactly. Matrix. I'm only taking the indices, the rows, which, so remember margin cells are the cell number 6 and 10 and 12 that were margin events. Now I'm taking the rows of these cells <laughs> and only the forward scatter and side scatter column. Right, because A my A started out being just forward and side scatter, so now I'm going to take the forward and side scatter of only the margin events. And I'm going to plot those on top of the existing plot in red. Okay, so far so good. And this CEX equals 2 stands for character expansion. So I want it to be a dot still, just like here I said point character should be a dot, but I want it to be a little bit bigger than these black dots because otherwise it's really difficult to see. And in fact I want, it, I want those dots to be twice as big. It just helps the margin events pop out a little bit. You can play around with that if you want. Yeah, you did, okay. Just, uh, you seem very pleased. <laughs> 
Here's one additional plotting feature we can add in order to make these plots presentable. Legend. So you can add a legend to the plot and you can by keyword specify that I want it at the top of the plot somewhere and the actual legend should read margin event are margin percent percent so this is another time where this paste function comes comes in handy this is the sentence that that produces I'm going to paste these things together the words margin events comma whatever my actual margin percent was remember earlier we calculated it 3.005 and then I'm gonna add the you know string percent so that it's clear <coughs> Are we'll on top of the. Uh, yeah, they will give you an error if you haven't. Yeah. So the color red is clearly the this why this is red, right? Because I want to like the, the red stuff is the one that's the margin events. And this PCH point character used in the legend. The code 19 corresponds to a solid circle. If you were interested in seeing what the uh, point characters are, you can do plot something like this. So the first, if, if you say point character equals one, or you don't say anything, if you don't specify point characters, the period, the dot, is going to plot these open circles. 19 is here. So if you have a if you're making a plot with a bunch of different things and you want to annotate them using point characters, there's a bunch. Okay, so now we've identified the the margin events. We've in fact plotted them. Now how do we actually take them out of our flow frame? Just plotting them in red doesn't really do anything. Well, it just so happens the flow frame object is made so convenient that you can literally say subset take my, my f clean is going to be now my original f minus the margin cells. Take them out. And now when you do that, you have 19,399 cells left. So we removed 601 cells, which were the margin cells. Does this make sense? <clears throat> so far, yeah. So let's see if I had anything else here. I don't think so. So, so far what we have done is compensated and removed the margin events. To show that we've done that with satisfaction. So we need to do the You tell plot. me. So we need to do plot again. Why don't you, instead of doing plot again, this is what you can do. What am I doing so far? Points. I'm going to be plotting it on top. I'm going to do it in green, I'm going to use dots still, but I'm going to make them just a little bit fa fatter than the black dots, just so that they pop. I didn't plot any green over top of the red, right? Otherwise you, it would be green. Is that good?
Now I'm going to move on to transformation. Let me just check how long I have. Okay, we got a lot of stuff, stuff to cover. So we talked about transformation. Let's just think about it before we try to apply it to our data. Think about how, how, how does it work in R. I just talk about it in theory, you know, this transformation stuff. So let's imagine you have some values that you want to transform. Let's say your values are A, 1, 10, 100. You know, those are standard exponent, exponential values, right? If you take the log 10 of A, you get 0, 1, 2, 2.73. Does that make sense? Because 1 is 10 to the 0 power, 10 is 10 to the 1st power, 100 is 10 to the 2nd power, and so on. <coughs> a cent of A is just another less straightforward transformation. This one is pretty clear because you guys know 1 to 10 to the power of whatever. A cinch is a little bit more fancy. But again, you put in some values, some other values come out. With the logical transform, however, there's actually a function that generates that transformation. It's not an automatically built into R1. Okay? So it's a little fancier. It's been added by, I don't even know which package has it. Or it's, it's just a fancier transformation. So you have to actually generate it. Let's look at the help. So it creates a subset of a bi-exponential transform, hyperbolic sine transformation function, blah, 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 blah. And look, it has a bunch of parameters, m, a. Um, you can read about the, the parameters. Remember how I said the logical is a bi-exponential? transform that has a bunch of parameters that you can tweak to make your data be the most effectively transformed that it can be. These parameters W, T, M, and A are the one, the things that you're tweaking. So if you don't do, if you don't put anything in this call to the logical transform, it will just use the default values, which are already pretty good. If you wanted to, you can actually play around with these values yourselves and tweak them and see what your data looks like, tweak them again, see what your data looks like. But don't worry, the standard ones look, work really well. So I just heard the whole community coding thing. The logical transform package in R is actually written by Wayne Moore, who actually invented the logical transform. So That's work. great. Yeah. So it, it, it's not as natural as you know typing in log 10 of A or A cinch of A. It's a, because it is a little bit of a fancier construction of a transformation. Um, so you can't just type logical of A. It's not going to really print anything. It just R knows what those values are, but it's not doing it. It's not printing them to the screen. So you have to actually print it. And here's what they look like. 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0 0.95, 1.7, 2.0. Just some some transformation of our original numbers: 1, 10, 100, 500, 1,000. Okay, so a log transform would give you these numbers. An arc cinch transform would give you these numbers. A logical transform gives you these numbers. <laughs> now let's try it with some of our actual values, not these A values, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. Let's try it with our values. Let's try it with the CD3 values there in the R780 channel. Here's the first four values. Now, you guys can run those lines of code yourselves. I'm going to switch to this. So everybody can run these lines here. What are we going to be doing? First of all, remember this MF row where I plotted three plots, one after the other? Now I'm going to do four plots, and I want to be able to see all of them at the same time so I can compare between the plots. So I'm doing two by two plotting region. 
one, two, three, four. It's going to look like this. Two rows and two columns of plotting region. And these two, don't worry about. They're just to make the margins of the plots a little bit smaller so that they fit on the screen a little bit better. Then I'm going to plot the density of my values. Remember, my values are just ex raw expression values of the CD3. I'm going to plot the density. Then I'm going to plot the density of the log 10 of those values. Then the density of the arc cinch of those values. Then the density of the logical transform of those values. Does everybody have those plots? So the first one is the raw uh, untransformed values. You can see how they're all bunched bunched up in the very beginning, the, low, the lowest values. You can see that there's two populations, probably a CD3 negative and a CD3 positive, right? But they're really bunched up there. They don't look that great. So you have to transform them so that your method will be a better able to see them. Here's the log transform. That, that looks pretty good. You know, there's a nice peak and then another peak, but this peak looks very small. Why is that? Because there's a bunch of negative values that log just ignored, decided they're throw away. The arc cinch, this is basically, you know, like a not very well parameterized version of the logical. If you don't play around with the parameters, then this is what you end up with, a split right around zero. And then here's the logical. Looks legit. Right? For example, you've done many monocytes and you're trying to look at C3 positive cells that make sense. Yeah? Yeah. Because then you've got, you still have some other cells that are not lymphocytes. Yeah. But most of them will be lymphocytes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So by, by doing this, we kind of convince ourselves that using the logical transform, transform is, is valid here. That it doesn't look like there's anything weird going on, you know, it's pretty straightforward data set. So now this next code, it's going to generate this plot, okay? So let's go through it line by line and see what it does. So again, I'm making my screen two by two. I'm going to plot, you know, the untransformed, the log tens, the arc cinch, and the logical. OK? That makes a stupid question. You've already, you've already called something F. Now you're re renaming what F is. Mm -hmm. but now the old F is gone. I have replaced it with this new. Exactly. Clean. But, but the 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 new F is based on the old F. It's a viral transformation with clean margins. So that, that's it's, okay because it's a separate it's actually a separate variable. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It just seems a little bit uh it's the so the reason why is because actually theoretically speaking, you should be replacing it all the time because that saves space in your memory. Your computer is like, I have this variable called f. Now I have this variable called f dot clean margin. Now I have this variable called f dot clean margin dot seven. Now I have this. But if I say, here's my variable f, my variable f clean margin. Now my new variable f, I'm going to, you know, it's, it's a little bit more efficient. And we just call them different things because our brains can't keep track of it. Well, yeah, right now I want us to be uh, learning it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. And also, because in these next steps, I'm going to be plotting this thing, and I don't want to type f.clean.margin. It's also laziness factors into it. It's also for, for clarity, just so you can read it better. So this first line, again, generates this 2 by 2 plot region. The first thing, notice how I'm using the um, flow-viz package. Plotting. This time I'm just giving it a frame. I'm not using the express f and, and that. 
smooth equals false because otherwise it looks too like to me it doesn't look super clear what's going on. The main the title of that plot is no transformation. Now how do I transform actually within the flow frame the, the data? I before I just kind of plotted log 10 of the vowels, right? The values. I just plotted it, but how do I actually make it transformed? You just take these values, which are the original values, the side scatter values, and you just replace them by the log 10 of those values. It just so you're, again you're replacing the yeah. Variable. So in my if you imagine the flow frame as a bunch of rows of cells and a bunch of columns of parameters, I'm taking that column, the side scatter a column, throwing out those values and putting in the log 10 of them back in, sort of. And when I do that, I don't know what that happened. When I do that, now I can plot basically the same thing I did up here, but now in this F, the side scatter values have been replaced with the log 10. How is that? It's a little... You're getting a warning message? No. I'm getting e is produced. Yeah, uh, that's because not a number. N-A-N means not a number and it's because you're taking the log 10 of... Oh wait, are you doing side scatter or did you skip ahead to the CD3? No, no, side scatter. Oh yeah, when you run it, when you run it twice, now you're taking the log of the log. So if you accidentally run a line twice, go back to here, go back to line eighty-one, where it's f equals f. Yeah. So is that clear? What I did. So now I'm going to do the exact same thing. I'm going to start with the clean margin, but now I'm going to take the arc cinch of, of the channel and plot that. And then I'm going to do the exact same thing, but this time with the logical. And that reproduced that earlier plot that I showed you. Oh, actually, I didn't do that here. So this is basically, instead of looking at this plot here to you know assess how your transformation is doing, you, you could instead do that plot that we just did. And in fact, that's the next step. Which I'm going to just let you run that on your own. It basically makes this exact same plot, but instead of for side scatter, for the CD3. So I'm going to let you do that and let me know when you're done. I'm going to get some coffee. Later. Okay, so I think that's probably good. We're good. So remember how I told you that the logical transform actually has these parameters that you know you tweak them and it makes your transformation better. So for this data set, it was actually pretty decent already. Uh, we didn't need to play around with the parameters at all. The default ones just worked. But there is actually this function that someone really nice wrote, which actually does some mathematical estimation of what is the optimal parameters and uses those. So instead of doing the logical transform, you can do the estimate logical transform, which first takes your sample, 
and tries to look at its distribution of, of the, the, those um, density plots that we were looking at earlier. It kind of like takes this in, looks at this, and tries to figure out what are the best parameters to make it look really nice and clean like this. And it does that for you behind the scenes. If you really, really want to know, you can do, of course, question mark. And there's logical transform explained in this help as well as the estimate logical. So you can read through all of these details and there's some references to papers and stuff that if you really wanted to read. But just take my word for it that it, it's worth a try. It's not necessarily always going to be the best one, but when you're trying to choose a transformation for your data, always visualize your data using one transformation and another and another and pick one of those. Don't just go with something blindly and never look to see and make sure that it looks good. It might not be always... There is no one transformation that works on all data sets ever, unfortunately, yet. But logical is pretty safe bet. And here's how the estimate logical actually works. First, you define your, your transformation using this, because it's fancy, we use the special function estimate logical. And because it estimates the parameters based on your data, you must supply it with your data. So you de define the transformation based on your data. And you also specify which channels you want to transform. So it's not just one at a time. You can actually give it all the channels you want transformed. So here's the call names of F. Remember, was all the parameters. It's like the, the columns of the matrix with all of the data, all the cells. And taking the third to the ninth channel gives me all the ones that are I know are log trans uh, log scale. So I must transform those. So I have here this line creates a logic estimate logical transform for all of those channels simultaneously. And the way that you apply it on the on the frame is using this function transform. It's written specifically for flow data. You specify the flow frame that you have and the transformation function that, that you have defined. So now F trans has is transformed. Now we want to visualize that and you know just double check. And now we're going to use this new um, package that is not in Bioconductor yet, Flow Density, because it has some nice visualizations added to it. First, you have to load this other package that's necessary for the visualizations and then the Flow Density package. We're again going to do a two by two plot because we're going to be having four little plots. And they look really crappy because I ran something twice. So if yours look like mine, it's because I, I ran a bunch of things twice. But they should look something like this. Does everyone have that? <laughs> If you don't have that, uh, it, it happened to me. Um, it's because I ran over one line a couple of times accidentally, and I probably retransformed it one more time. So just go back and rerun all the lines up until that one. Um, OK, so what's this? Forward scatter versus side scatter. Notice how we have removed the margin events. They're not there anymore. Then I have plotted CD3 versus this here is the viability dump channel. So it's, these are the dead cells. And this is the CD3 positive live cells. Here I have KI67 versus CD4. I randomly chose these just so that we visualize all the colors. So looks like CD4 has a pretty nice, you know, positive and negative fraction, right? KI67 is kind of, you know, I guess I would draw my gate around here somewhere. It's kind of, doesn't really have that many positives. 
and then I have CD8 and CD127. Doesn't look particularly interesting right now. Does this make sense? Looks a little bit more familiar. <laughs> Tried to copy Flojo a little bit. <laughs> is that what time is it? I... What time was the coffee break supposed to be at? Three o'clock. Okay, let me just see if we can do a couple more things. Well, what did we do so far? We probably want to do the same to the whole flow set, right? Not just to the one flow frame. So we're going to work with for loops. Is anybody familiar with a for loop in programming? Very good, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> So just just uh, to illustrate how it's done in R, if you haven't done it in R, um, this is what it is basically. You say for, and then you put some kind of variable you're going to re refer to within the for loop for i in the values 1 to 3. Print i squared. And there it prints 1, 4, 9 when you execute that. Make sense? It doesn't have to be i, and it doesn't have to be numbers. It can be a longer variable name, like cham, channel, in the, the call name, so the parameters of the flow set for to the number of columns. No, because that <laughs> lacks meaning. You, your variable names should be sensible. They shouldn't be generic. I'm not going to use I for a channel, I, I'm going to use Chan. Because then when I read this, print channel, I'm printing the channel. <laughs> Informative channel names. So, the function for mm -hmm. is sort of like running a script. So instead of being able to do this for 12 samples that I've run. Yep. Whatever is inside of here, you you do we did our code for the single flow frame right but so far I mean we, we did a lot of extra things but you know we managed to remove the margin events and transform it now I'm not gonna be removing the margin events for the second one and transforming that one and then the third one right here's your flow frame remove the margin events transform but do this for all twenty of them. So that's what that's the idea. So it's yeah. Yeah. It's a do this while I go. Yeah. Yeah. Iteration. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So I do this here. These these two lines uh, to close all the plots because again it's getting a little heavy on the memory usage of the computer. Um, and I'm reloading the, f uh, the data again just this one time because we have been kind of rerunning our lines of code a few times here and there. We may have accidentally affected the original flow set. And I want to start fresh because we want to do this for loop thing properly, right? <coughs> now, um, Let's see. Remember how we plotted our flow frame uh, with forward scatter and side scatter, and then we saw these cells at the end and decided that 250,000 was the right value to choose? Well, I don't want to be plotting each and every one of the 20 samples and making sure that the 250,000 is indeed the right value to choose for all of them. So what I'm going to do instead, when I have a large enough sample, uh, data set, so here I have 20 samples, instead of plotting on 20 of them, I'm going to take 
at random a few cells from each of them, each of the 20 sets. And I'm gonna, so it's like a pooled sample. I guess you guys do that sometimes as well in like controls and stuff, right? You, you pool your cells together to get a better... You pull the events from different areas as well. Yes, yeah. So from the first frame, I'm randomly selecting, let's say, a thousand cells, randomly. And a thousand from this one, a thousand from that one. And hopefully I can get sort of a broader overview of what my all of my data looks like. And this is it. And the way that I got this random sample from each of the frames, I'm not going to go into detail on that. What I have done is supplied you guys with this function that I wrote. You can actually open it and, and see what's in it if you want. It's in the uh, folder code and then in the folder support code, support functions. If you look through this, I have all these little functions here that I have written for you that will make life much easier for you so you don't have to, every little thing that you do, you don't have to, you know, do it from scratch like we've been doing so far today. So it's actually to help you guys out for later. When you oh. It's free code. <laughs> Just for you, nobody else has this. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, and it is possible that some of these functions will not work perfectly for you every time. But because I have given you the starting point, you should feel free to go through them and see what's go how I'm getting rid of the or how I'm getting the lymphocytes. For example, I have one function called gate lymphocytes or something like that. And remember how we talked about you must put it into logical terms. How do you gate out the debris exactly? You know, oh, I do this. Well, how do you do this? I have made decisions about how I do this while coding this function. If you read through it carefully, I have some pretty good, you know, explanations within the function. You can see what my logic behind it is. And if you disagree with some part of it, feel free to change it to suit your own needs. Anyways, we're not going to go through this at all right now. I just want to point out that I have... I have this function that I have written get global frame and what it is is basically you just apply the flow set and it gives you this randomly pulled frame that represents the whole flow set in just one frame so you can visualize all of your data into a sort of one as if it was just one. So I have done this for you. You can go through it on your own time and try to figure out how I did it but for now let's not talk about it. Just take it for granted. In order to make use of my functions, tell R that we're going to be using these functions, you must make R read my script. So the way you do that is using source. And now you can actually make use of my function get global frame. Now, global frame. I call it global because it's a global overview of your, your whole set. It's just a flow frame, right? It's just a flow frame object. It doesn't have a name because it's not anything, really. It's just randomly generated. And the way I've written my function is it kind of gives you twice as many cells as you, you start with just to make sure it gets every little artifact that could be in the data set. And this, you plot it exactly the same way you plot any other flow frame, right? You put the flow frame and your channel names, uh, your Y limit if it looks funny otherwise. Now, instead of just removing the margin cells, I decided to just sort of gate, roughly gate the lymphocytes very rough. It, correct me if I'm wrong, my opinion is that these cells should be kind of removed. They're a little bit, you know, on the, the low end. Uh, these cells are probably doublets or something like that. Same with these. So really I just want these cells. Do you agree? So these values so far we have not generated in an automatic way yet. Um, 
I just eyeballed it. I just looked at it and decided these are the sort of static gate values that I would use to roughly gate the, the lymphocytes. So it's exactly the same thing we did before where we set it at 250,000, except now I have a bunch of them that end up sort of outlining the population that I'm really interested in. Does that make sense so far? How did I, like it's kind of difficult to eyeball this, right? It's, you know, a bit of a mess. Uh, so you can actually, uh, the side scatter is fairly clear. You know, it's really like there's a bulk of the cells here, cut, cut off there. But the forward scatter is a little un unclear where to draw the line. So if you wanted to, want, you could use a different visualization, plot the density of, of, of the forward scatter channel. Yours will look slightly different because you generated a different randomly selected global frame, right? So yours will be just slightly different from mine. Does this make sense, sort of? What does yours what? look like very different? Or? No, it doesn't. But oh, why, I don't know. why did I, how did I select something that was different from yours? Uh, so, because I remember how I had 20 samples, oh, but I wanted. Oh, then it took a sample. Yeah, I just took sample. randomly some so cells. Then, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. I didn't want to take you know, the first 10,000 because then it would be. So does, does this make sense as a very rough preliminary approach to removing debris? It's it's very basic, very, like it's not like you set up flow joint, you do a nice little circle around it, you know, because, you know, the cells should be all in a circle. It's kind of more rough, like get rid of these, get rid of these, and get rid of these. But it sort of makes sense, right? Does it? No? It's sort of, it's sort sort of, of makes what, sense? It's sort of what we do. Yeah, anyway, okay, yep. yeah. Good. The side scatter is pretty clear. Just this one time, because we have, this is the last thing I'll do before we break for, for coffee. Um, because we only do have 20 samples, it's not 100, why don't we just plot these supposed gates, you know, 35,000, 125,000, and 600, over top of every one of our samples, just to visualize what they look like, and convince ourselves that they do indeed work for every one of our samples. So it's not perfect, right? There's still um, some, in some of them it looks like the, the lower debris is a little, there's still some left over that we're not getting out, and then there's some that we've gated a little too much maybe. But for now, for a starting point, it's, it's good enough. If I had a very large data set, let's say 100 samples, Clearly, I'm not going to be plotting each and every one of them and looking. And, but what I would do is randomly select 10 of them and plot those. And just, just to double check that my data is um, reasonably of good quality, there's not too much variation <laughs> if I were to do this kind of approach.
so far so good. So what do we do? We first sort of pre-processed one single frame by removing the margin events and transforming it. Then we decided maybe we should go to you now to the whole flow set. But we didn't want to be looking at each and every frame one by one. So we created this pooled sample and decided to kind of use that as our basis for our logic of creating steps to, to, to pre-process. So, so far we're at the point where we have created a, we have designed, we haven't actually applied, but we have designed an approach to remove most of the debris in our flow set. And we're going to do that next after the copy break. <coughs>